reason community is becoming such a buzzword right now is because it's intangible and it's like it's speaking to metrics that are actually important that drive people to purchase and want to rebuy the product. You know, we're all scientists. We want numbers to drive everything. And that is critical, critical, critical. I mean, numbers drive everything. And so the best marketers today are actually as much numbers driven as they are creative. So I don't think you can ever turn a finance person into, into an a intuitive and instinctive marketer, <laughs> but I think that you have to do turn marketing people into finance. Into finance. All right, David. Well, thanks for coming out to New York. Have you talked to the guys at Fermat before, Rishabh, Jane? No, no. He's got a cool business. They're backed by Greylock. Um, right. I did the first uh, in person with him. We we just launched season one of the podcast. It's had a good reception. Yeah, I had a good listen to a, a few bits to see what people were talking about. And I, I'm, I'm an open book, so it's been uh, my career has been a lot of a lot of fun. A lot of challenges, but you know, feel yeah, very I, fortunate. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take you through. You know, I think there's a lot to cover as far as like marketing is concerned. You know, some of the different things that I think you bring perspective on, just in terms of like life and 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 building. You have a, a book coming up called Unboxing. Yeah, that's right. It's kind of a synthesis of your what is it? Three decades of of business uh, experience on consulting, consumer. And on the marketing side? Yeah. I mean, someone said to me, one of my mentors, I think you have mentors your whole life. And one of my mentors said to me, no one's interested in your life story. They're just, you know, if you were a super famous for something else, maybe they'd be interested in that. I think what people be interested in, the lessons that you've learned in, in your in your career and having really spent my entire career bringing new ideas to life, I felt like the best thing I could do is to focus on what does it take to bring a new idea to life and to build a business around it. Cause you know, I've seen millions of great ideas in my life. Half of them I thought were absolutely incredible ideas, but very few of them ever make it mm -hmm. because the difference between a great idea and a great business is, is everything really. So, and, and the everything that it is, I thought I'd try and share that in a book. How do you system systematize that? as like an investor, as an entrepreneur choosing what to your, to invest your time in? Like, how do you decide what's a good opportunity to pursue? That's an interesting question. I, first of all, it's about the people. And if someone comes along and I'm impressed by them as an individual, I think automatically you want to listen to somebody. And so the first question is, is am I inspired by that individual? Because I think inspiration is a critical part of business success because then they're going to have to inspire everybody, everyone who works for them, everyone who buys their products. So first is, do they inspire me? And if they inspire me, then I listen to their idea. And the next thing I probably go to is there a big need in the market for that. And then I go to cost structure of can you meet that need in a cost effective way that has a high margin? So the business model. And then ultimately it's, you know, you put all that together, the demand, the, the person that you're talking to, uh, the cost structure of the idea, the kind of business model. And then you say, do I really believe this person can execute? And, uh, and I make my decision on that. And then ultimately, so that's my investment decision. And then ultimately, you know, they've got to get enough money and, uh, and then just focus execution, execution, execution. And, uh, and, and it's hard. So there's basically a different skill set between early entrepreneur and then like later stage company uh, in terms of the things that you need to be good at. Uh, that definitely is. And in fact, that transition is a very hard one. And I don't think I've really played it well myself yet because I think I'm much more suited to bringing the new idea to life than I am, you know, the, the, the ongoing business. And basically stuff. early stage operator, knowing how to come up with an idea, set good foundation, generate interest, raise capital, rather than coming into something that's that's already been established. Re reflect on that because I know you're alluding to your time recently at ABLE and then also having started the fascination in Lisa previously. Yeah, so I think, I think that early stage goes perhaps a little bit more than early traction. You know, if I put a number on it, I would say that there's a, there's a difference between you know, the, the first million getting revenue is tough. Getting to sort of 10 million in a consumer business, obviously it's different in a different style of business. Getting to 10 million 
you know, has its different challenges and 10 to 20 is about the same. And then there's this kind of leap of uh, changing the management, getting different people in, people with more experience. And, th and that'll take you to about 50 million, maybe to 100 million. And at that point, everything's different. You know, you don't have the same growth opportunities. You don't have the same, you, you can't get the same drive out of people. You've got to get all your processes right. You've got to have, you've got to reward people differently, attract different types of people, people that have different experience. You know, uh, 20 million growth from 100 million is totally different from the first 20 million. And as soon as you realize that, and as soon as you realize that, that you know, maybe you're suited to one thing and not the other, you, you can maximize yeah, your you strengths. You just need to know when to get out of the way. In your experience, like, let's take Lisa, for example, or the fascination. Where did you play there? For Lisa, was it zero to 100? Like, how, how did that go? Yeah. So the, Lisa, the early idea came from, um, you know, I had a service business. We were helping some of the largest companies in the US. This is the strategy consulting yeah, business. You were just... it, was, it was strategy and innovation. So we were working with companies like General Mills and uh, Purina on uh, how to utilize the whole idea of socializing, uh, socialization on on uh, on social media uh, to build communities, to build growth, to grow scale, build e-commerce businesses. We were helping them do that. So strategic, but also at the execution end. And I had a really tremendous team together. And we made a decision in 2013 where they would continue to serve those businesses. And it was very profitable for us. We were doing that, well. That was you. So you were working on that business for what, 15 years then? Pro approximately yeah. 15 okay. years. Yeah. So, and, um, and then we said, you know, it's time to try and take all our ideas and actually launch our own. And just through some, a business that I had previously came up with the idea to start Lisa, the mattress company, Casper was not launched at the time. In fact, they launched while we were still planning getting close to our launch, but it was an obvious gap in the market. And so I was the, you know, that started as a single member LLC to get technical. I was the, you, you were know, the, the sole, sole prop. Owner. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, my management team got involved and then a partner launch partner, co-founder got involved and we launched that thing from scratch and that business went, um, 27 or 28 million in the first year, way beyond anything we thought we would achieve 78 million in the second year and about 125 or 128 million in the third year in sales. So, and at that point, probably I was done. Like, and, uh, it took me a, a, a little while to realize that maybe one or two other people realized it before me. And I became the board chair of that company, which, which was fine, still involved in helping drive sales momentum, but really from, from afar, from, a, from a distance and from, uh, an advisory role. And, and I, I don't think they necessarily got all their people right first time around, uh, when the investor that I brought, brought in started to get more involved in execution and choosing the team, but eventually they got a, a good team together. It took them a couple of years. And had I realized it earlier, I probably could have done it more quickly. How did you deal with constraints with that business? You said you exceeded expectations. Like, you know, year one was much more than you had anticipated. There are obviously capital constraints, inventory constraints, um, advertising constraints. How did you think about like unlocking those roadblocks when you saw an avenue to scale? Yeah. So interestingly in that business, it, it was almost the perfect business model for a while because it was positive working capital because we were not making the mattresses until the orders came in. And so we had the cash from the consumer. And then the order went directly to one of two manufacturers they manufactured. And we had, I think, um, you know, 45 days credit, maybe even from the beginning. It's crazy. Uh, and yes. fulfillment on that. They did all the fulfillment direct from factory T time though. To... So, uh, they, 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 the, the promise was to get it out of the door within, within three days, three to five days. It's like infinitely scalable. <laughs> it, it, well, it was infinitely scalable. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't, that was not. Uh, capital became a problem when the cost of acquisition started, started to rise, rise. which yeah. was you guys started in 2013. You sold the business last year, so yeah. So we started it actually in in 2014, uh, towards the end, right at the end of the year, 2015, 2016, 2017. They were all all relatively straightforward, and things started to tighten up in 2018, 
and then um and then we know what happened with you know third party data and the, iOS 14 yeah. ATT changes yeah. and honestly they make it I, I'm curious just thinking about mattress companies you know what happened to Casper and like like CLV on those customers it's just it's pretty much like uh you need to be net profitable on the first customer you, yeah you have to be you yeah. have to be and yeah. you need solid solid yeah. margin because you're not upselling customers with pillows or any yeah no I, absolutely right and in fact you know my favorite diagram is the unit economics in any direct to consumer business i i uh I, I always put my 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 ultimate sales potential sales price so the the advertised price at the top and then the discount and then you've got to go through all the various other things the transaction costs and at the bottom you've got cogs that you can't do anything about and then the actual order metric yeah and then you you get this gap in the middle and that's and that is the kind of maximum allowable marketing to make a dollar and as soon as you go above that in most businesses i would say because I, I think that a lot of business should try to make money on the first order 100 percent. yeah so I'm, I, you're working with that gap yeah and so i mean facebook really ushered in this new generation of business model direct to consumer where you could have scale because you could reach so many different people. And if you were profitable and you had a fulfillment operation like Lisa, you can do those, those numbers that you mentioned. I mean, I, you know, I hate to show my age here, but I don't mind showing it because I've been around this since the beginning of e commerce, yeah. but it was no different from, um, television before like television, the, the very first direct to consumer business I started direct response business. Was, yeah. It was convert was converting uh, viewers of television programs to buyers of vacations actually. And I had a show on the travel channel three times a day. Cool. So I, it, it's really interesting how similar those, you know, the ad programs for like those direct response TV ads are, you know, they, the same methodology is input into, you know, direct consumer Facebook ads. It, it, you know, you know, when people, build landing pages now and i help a lot of people do that the seven step messaging platform that i use is the same seven steps that i use for direct response tv to take uh, that uh yeah take us through that what is that i mean it's really common sense you know the first step is really understanding the consumer need or desire is it really there and that that helps you identify your customer but most importantly if you're not if you're not basically meeting a need or fulfilling a desire you're not going to sell anything the second one is what's wrong with the current solutions. So you've always got to, you've always got to have something that is a better way to fulfill that need than a current way. And the third one are the benefits. So you, you can't talk about your product in terms of features or your service. You have to talk about it in terms of benefits. And there are only three sustainable benefits that count that in terms of categories. One is emotional benefits. One is functional. It works better than it did before. And the other is financial, but financial isn't sustainable either because someone can always come out with a cheaper way. The fourth area are the reasons to believe. So it's the science or it's the demonstration or some reason to believe. The fifth of the testimonials, it's like, if you don't believe us, believe people like you. The sixth is the value. How are you going to present the value? And you've got to not forget the call to action. And those seven things exist on landing pages that exist in, in, performance marketing assets they put they exist everywhere and yeah these are you know fun time tested fundamentals and if you if they're not there like then you're not gonna you're not gonna you're not gonna sell you're yeah. not gonna sell product do you have a way that you think about um coordinating those steps or are they literally sequential linear you know it? interestingly uh you have to know which of the seven steps you're working in so if you think of the consumer journey from first impression through to repurchase all of those things you don't need every one of the seven steps every time but you do have to know where you are in the process so you know the first time you need a very strong hook so you got to have a very very strong way of doing step one step two and step three which is people have to identify that this is something that i need or i want then they have to identify that this is a better solution and then they have to be kind of sold on a benefit to take the first step and then as you go as you go through the customer journey you're also going through the messaging step so it really depends on you know where you're working in terms of the customer journey and also how well people know your product yeah and i mean that comes back to brand you said something interesting regarding like financial benefit you know 
most of these consumer verticals are becoming commoditized because you know barriers to entry are just so low today you can launch a product on shopify and find a producer it's relatively easy it's actually interesting when we talk to our clients who are really high growth they try and keep a really low profile in terms of doing things like podcasts because they don't want replicability and it takes time to build brand trust right yeah i mean this happened in uh, mattresses right like yeah, I, I, I was I was always like concerned about other people finding out about what we were doing. But, you know, at, at some point you have to determine when does brand become Im- important? And I'm I'm less cagey as I used to be. Yeah. And I used to be because I, I just feel. Well, I think that- brand now is it's more important when launching launching the venture because you don't have those acquisition economics before if you were first to market and you could spin up a funnel and you had good unit economics and a way to fulfill, you could scale quickly. It was almost like, how quick are you to the punch to offering the solution? Now, the fastest growing, most of the fastest growing consumer brands I speak to, they're growing by virtue of lifetime value and just like getting people to fall in love with the community. And community is just a word for retention. Retention, repeat. I was going to say repeat, yeah, but same thing. Yeah, look, I I just got off a a leadership team meeting in the latest venture that I'm running, which is a 14-year-old startup. It's a 14-year-old company, but was um, needed a massive turnaround in capital restructuring this year, Able. And um, I showed them the new brand work that we're doing for next year. And the excitement amongst the team is just palpable. They can, you can see it. And someone sent me a message during the meeting to say, this is as excited as I've ever been working for the company because people still love brand. And if you don't intentionally think about your brand, think about what you want to mean to your consumer, then you have nothing really. And, you know, I felt like coming into the company that a wonderful origin story, an incredibly supportive customer base because it's mission driven. It's all about empowering women. But I didn't really know what to expect walking into the store, nor did other people. So we're now really intentionally working on brand. We happen to be Nashville based. So we're going to double down on Nashville and, and, and presenting that and presenting what it looks and feels like. Even to the team working in the company gives everybody this new kind of spring in their step, a new feeling of of, of excitement and you know the head of wholesale said this is great you know our, our, our retail customers are going to get this they're going to understand it they're going to get behind it and we know that the consumers already love the company will and now we can talk to a whole new a whole new group of customers about what able is because we actually have a story to tell so h- how many how many ventures have you been a part of now in consumer you mentioned you started in strategy consulting Give us a sense of how tenured you you are. You know, I, I had a company uh, once called Journey Nine, and it was I'd worked out then it was the ninth startup I had done, <laughs> and I'm and I'm I'm a few years on since then. So uh, so uh, many and uh, and and I get as much of a of a of a kick out of being with young entrepreneurs at, in, at the very early stage of of what they're doing and mentoring them now. You know where where I am now, and I, you know, I was telling someone the story recently. It, it, it happens to be Katie uh, Diesti at uh, Viv Viv for your V, and she had called me very early on in her startup, and and it's you know interesting company. You can go take a look at it, but she had a a, a, a supplier that was really screwing her, that that was giving her a minimum order quantity that just m- didn't make any sense. I gave her one piece of advice about how to go back and cut that by 10 so that she wouldn't need quite as much capital. And I'm not saying that that had a, a huge impact on her, but I know that it got her out of a pretty difficult spot. And now, you know, she's doing great. And so I love, I love that. So in terms of the companies I'm involved in as an early stage investor and advisor, I'd say it's 30 to 40 today. And I spend time on maybe five or six of them and focus on one or two. Yeah. The reason for my question is I'm kind of interested how you see consumer evolving, like the general landscape, having started in TV and original direct to consumer moving to digital now actually being in the Able's a retail first venture. Um, So I'm interested to learn more about that, but also just like with the amount of reps that you, that you you've had, like I want to understand how you think about like compounded learnings and then, staying excited about going into the next venture and 
how that changes your perspective in terms of like what you want to get out of what you're doing. You know, because you reach a certain point in your in your venture where you're like, what, you know, what am I do, what am I going to do with this, right? And yeah, yeah. So I think that question is loaded in a couple of different directions. One is an easy answer in that you know I have our 2025 plan for Able as being 50 50 direct and and wholesale. So in terms of omnichannel, I, I think omnichannel is critical. I think it's actually now potentially more contribution from the sale of an item through wholesale through a retailer than it is quite oh, often yeah. direct. So I think, you know, part of the, that answer is that, you know, omnichannel is important. Finding your retail distribution is critical for the long term. In terms of, you know, my, my, my own my own focus, you know, that that's a difficult one, really. I know that I'm not ready to, you know, I, you know, hang up my boots and, and, and stop right now. You know, I, I think there's an enormous amount to learn. And I think ultimately, you know, the thing about experience is, is I mean, so there, there is a line in a, in a, in a, in a musical Starlight Express that the trouble with experience is once you've got it, it's all you've got. Um, and so, you know, part of the challenge when you, when you get older is how do you stay relevant? So, so you have this kind of thing going on in your head that, you know, I don't want to try and be young, but I do want to be relevant. And I think the relevance is the idea of a duck. And that is that it is incredibly hard work to succeed. Things are changing all the time. And so beneath the surface, you are running 100 miles an hour in each different direction. But you have to give an air of confidence. You've got to inspire teams. You've got to inspire your customers. And you've got to give this 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 unflappable, non-panicked, most young entrepreneurs or ADD, if they're not actually ADD, they act like it. They're kind of going from one crisis to another because, you know, management of a startup is like being a, a fire chief. You're just putting out fires every day. Yeah. And so, um, and so, you know, I always believe there's room for one more brand. I always believe there's room for one more great idea. I think cons consumers are constantly looking for new and different and you have to give it to them, you know, like, so you've got to constantly innovate. You got to take your core products and that's what you're going to see Able do, take its core products, its best sellers, and innovate around them, make them more interesting, give reasons to come back and buy another one or a kind of different version of what they've already bought. And, and you know, innovation, excitement, inspiration is key. And I think I can still bring that to, to, to people. And I think that, you know, you've got to have a deep well, understanding of the number. I mean, that's what the fascination was all about in terms of just – there are so many new products. Your point is that basically human nature will always gravitate towards the new thing. Like there's always opportunity. Our, 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 our tastes are consistently changing. What the market wants is consistently changing. And therefore there will be demand for new products and services of some kind. And so then it comes down to execution and that's, that's difficult. And that's, that's half the battle. Yeah. I mean, look, ultimately it's all about execution. Um, you know, just because of sheer numbers, I've seen more ideas in my career that have not succeeded than ideas that have, because we all know what the what the chances of success are. Um, I've always liked to feel like that 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 we, you in your advisory role, and me when I, I'm advising, we want to give people a three times better chance of success than they would have without us. That was always my measure, you know. <laughs> so, like, if if uh, your barometer uh, for if you're providing value, yeah, it's I'm, tough when you're an advisor and you're like giving fractional time and you're yeah. getting some sort of compensation for it. Yeah, but uh, but ultimately, people want to say, you know, what can you do to help me? And I always would say, I think I can make it three three times more likely that you'll succeed than fail. Mm. That still means failure is more likely than <laughs> success, but I think I can help you. And, um, you know, and, and, and how do you do that? Uh, you know, in, in a number of different ways that have become really important to me, you know, I think I've told you this in the past, but I hate the idea of minimal viable product in yeah. a startup. I just, I just think that, you know, in, from my days in the hospitality world, if I was selling someone a, a viable room in a new hotel, that would just not excite them very much. And ultimately, the, the whole way that socialization of good ideas works, good new products works, is that people, when they, when they 
like unbox it to take a turn from 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 the mattress industry when they unbox it and it's that moment of truth between what they were anticipating and what they experience if the experience exceeds the anticipation then it becomes, they, they want to talk about it they want to share it and yeah. that and that and that's what and that so the magic is being remarkable and so one of the things i always say to startup uh entrepreneurs and founders is be remarkable like don't be viable, be remarkable. And that means the first time you talk to a consumer or your customer, if it's business to business, just make sure that it exceeds their expectations by a significant amount. And that, that means, you know, don't go until you're ready. Don't go until many, many consumer products companies go before the things are ready, like customer service and, and, you know, even the box, you know, everything is important. Everything is important. I think people have become really obsessed with, you know, performance marketing has been part of the zeitgeist now, you know, especially in consumer. It's what a lot of people want to talk about. And for, for very good reason, it's what I do by trade. But I think some of the more intangible KPIs that are harder to track are just as important, like word of mouth. The reason community is becoming such a buzzword right now is because it's intangible and it's like it's speaking to metrics that are actually important that that drive people to to purchase and 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 want to rebuy the product but the more i think about community it's like engagement how much do people want to engage with your brand how much do they want to engage with your product how much do they want to talk about it with their friends how do they derive a sense of belonging with your spouse values that's more on the brand marketing side that i think may have been lost with the past generation of direct consumer brands that we're starting to see again you and i, I totally agree with you i just couldn't agree more you and i have spoken about the changing role of like the marketer or the the C, even like the ceo too in my mind it comes down to like an understanding of performance marketing brand marketing uh, financial engineering or unit economics, how you're going to integrate AI and then and then measurement. I'm of the opinion that there are a lot of marketers who are being primed and can be groomed for the CEO position, which is, you know, I think a fairly new concept. How do you think about, you know, the best and most effective marketers? And, you know, I'm interested to hear your take on uh, the changing role of the CEO too. Yeah, so... Again, it's a kind of timing thing. So let's talk about companies that are zero to a hundred million in revenue. Because I think once you get above that, you know, the CEO is really a it's yeah, it's like a figurehead and yeah, reporting and, and, to the and, board, and they're, they're process driven and they're like a human resources person really because they're constantly dealing with people issues. And you do that anyway, even on the way to a hundred million. But so let, let's assume we're talking the, about the operator CEO. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I. I the reason why I think it's going to fall into the hands of marketing, whereas historically it might have gone the way of the CFO in terms of leadership, is this the idea of inspiration and, and gut feel. I think that, you know, we're all scientists. Those of us that come from the consulting background, we want numbers to drive everything. And that is critical, critical, critical. I mean, numbers drive everything. And so the best marketers today are actually as much numbers driven as they are creative. And so when we talk about a CMO becoming a CEO, it isn't because their left brain is, or their, you know, it's not one side of brain of their other or the other that is, is important. It's that to be an outstanding marketer today, you have to really care about, you know, to, it's, it's, you know, it's three in the afternoon, whatever time it is, where do our sales need to be to tell us that this week's campaign is going well? And if they're not where they need to be, then what changes can we make? What pivot can we make? That's what great marketers do today. They're much more involved in the in the detail than they are about, you know, um, the, the the strategy. But the strategy is important too. So I don't think you can ever turn a finance person into, into an a intuitive, marketer. instinctive marketer. <laughs> but I think that you can. You have to do turn marketing people into finance. into finance. We're going through this exercise right now. So traditionally, you know, in our in our consultancy and the agency practice. We have like our senior resources are their marketers, but they're trained on finances. They can work through a PL, they can cut unnecessary technology costs, they can refactor your team structure to give you better, to give you more juice on on margin as ad efficiency and advertising costs get more expensive. We're having this discussion now where it's like and, and that that analysis for 
like a specific channel or like a specific part of the revenue equation, whether that's acquisition, that responsibility needs to move even further downstream to the paid media manager who's managing the channel. And so this marketer can become more of an economist and they're making more broad stroke investment decisions. Yeah, and It's easier to teach someone finance than it is to actually teach them how to roll up their sleeves. Yeah, and- I'm, I'm smiling because... You know, Abel's a small company. You know, we're not yet $20 million in revenue. But I have a team. It's it's incorrectly called the promo team because it's more like the campaign and promotional team. But it's a creative person. It's the digital marketer, paid media, and it's the person that has all the influences and partnerships. And above them, they have, you know, a senior marketing person who's all about insights. And um, every week, we look at last week, in terms of the actual numbers, the and, and not just the top line and bottom line contribution, but everything in between, the AOV, the conversion rate, everything. And we talk about where we are. And then there's this kind of team that are the team that has to work to improve those numbers next week. And if they don't understand the numbers, if they don't understand the, the reason why Able has improved is because things like the return rate has gone down, the AOV is creeping up, our acquisition cost is coming down. Those, those are all numbers. Yeah, they but, materially influence the but, outcome that you but want. But the to way see. to change them yeah. is marketing. Like you can't change them. Well, look at, I mean, look at like conversion rate, you know, I mean, or revenue is just traffic times conversion rate times average order value. So like when you do a, I mean, you're a consulting guy, you know, like a MISI analysis, root cause analysis, you know, when you're actually looking to improve some of these metrics, it comes down to, how do we get people to click through our ads uh, at a higher clip and, and then convert? So yeah, so so we were we were looking at our plans again this morning for holiday this month, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Cyber Weekend in particular, and the date. What what day do we launch the campaign and what day do we go heavy on the campaign? And I said, let's go look at last year because I know one thing that you're going to see. You're going to see our traffic going up and then coming down. And then you're going to see our conversion rate coming up and coming down. Because the thing about these massive consumer buying events is that people's propensity to buy is higher. So I call it you fish when the fish is swimming and you and you fish where they're eating. So that's what you have to do. And so and they were and I, and I looked at it and I said, we're, we're planning this campaign too late because go look at last year when the traffic started to build. That isn't us being cleverer. That's just more people starting to look around for deals for Black Friday. So we have to be there. So everything is a science. And then within the science is this art of how do you create an ad that's going to more people, is the hook good? How they, are they going to click? Is the landing page going to drive them to where we want to be? Is the AOV going to be right? You know, if, if we see our AOV starting to drop, even now, like over a weekend, if our AOV this weekend is less than, it must be something we did on the page. We must have driven people yeah. to, to purchase it. So everything is scientific and yet everything is creative. Yeah. So a lot of these marketing challenges are like, they're human problems too, because it's about, who is running the programs and frankly, how much transparency do they have into where you want to take the business, right? Because for them to know how important average order value is, they need to know the end outcome and they need to know the current state of affairs. So what I've seen, what I've, where I've seen issues with marketing teams is like a lack of transparency in the org chart to take those resources who are traditionally more junior executing on the channel, but they have material impact on the end goal to get them into the equ- into the conversation really and explain to them how some of these things work. So they know how important their job is to your bottom line. Yeah. So, I mean, I know a lot of companies have flash reports, which is last week's performance. We have a flash report and insights and we share it broadly. I mean, if you, I should have shown you today's flash report for last week before we started and then shown you where it went to, it went far and wide in the organization um, because, you know, people need to know. And, and also they need to know, that we had a pretty good month last month, you know, like we're on a we're on a fiscal calendar, so our month has already ended October, and we didn't hit the top line that we wanted, but we were still profitable. And the reason that we were, you know, people will remember October twenty twenty three as being a time when a world event really impacted a lot of things. And I'm not going to, I don't know when this is going out, so I'm not going to talk about that today. Probably like two three weeks. Yeah, so it, we'll still be living the world event 
that took place and our sales were hit, you know, so that's going to happen. You can explain it away and then you just move on. Yeah. It's empowering when you're in a position and you know all of the metrics that drive revenue and you know, kind of, you probably get into a business now and you're like, all right, I know how to fix this. I know how to turn things around. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, I call it flying blind or, or you know, like we were, I, I, when I, when I got involved with the latest company I'm running, Able, first company ever in my, in my career since business school a long, long time ago, I went young to business school where I haven't hired the team that I'm working with today. I'm, I'm working with a, a team that I inherited and I went in there and I felt like everyone was flying blind and that isn't the case now. So the first thing you have to do is get the numbers and be honest with yourself. How are we really doing? You know, even go, I went back and I restated historic losses because we were doing a lot worse as a company than we thought we were. And so first we corrected that. Then we set slightly unrealistic goals because I always like to be slightly unrealistic. I think entrepreneurs always are a little bit, you know, a, a little bit high on the expectations, um, but setting, you know, somewhat realistic goals and then going after them and then being, being brave enough to say, how are we doing against these goals? And sometimes like September was great. We were ahead of them. And sometimes like October, we're a little behind, but not disastrously behind. So switching gears here, you've had a couple of successful exits with most notably Fascination, Lisa. How do you like prime the business for some of those events? Uh, were they active goals you were working towards? Did they kind of approach you? And you know, how do you think about that? Yeah. So, um, and I guess as an add on, and I know I keep adding these really long questions. How do you think about like building value in, in the business equity value that, you know, in this, it, that gives you optionality? Yeah. So, so, you know, both of those situations and many before a learning experience, because I don't, I, I would say, you know, an optimal outcome is that everyone involved in the business um, from the early employees right through to the latest investors feels really, really good about them. And, you know, the jury is still out on the fascination because it was a largely equity based deal, but hopefully everyone will be happy with it in the long run. And certainly in Lisa, I, I, I'm disappointed that I wasn't able to satisfy everyone in the process. That was a matter of timing, really, because, you know, timing is so important in an exit. I mean, building a company for exit is you can do all the things, you can put all the right things in place, but ultimately headwinds happen. You know, we had a competitor in the mattress industry who just spent their way to growth and made life difficult for everybody else. And that eventually, when the acquisition cost just went through the roof, it changed the underlying value. So I feel like we did everything right to build value, but ultimately the outcome wasn't where I hoped it would be, but it wasn't terrible. And quite honestly, it was reasonably good for me uh, personally, but not everyone got the kind of return you'd expect from that kind of growth. And so, you know, I, when I work with young founders today, I talk about not necessarily, I don't really like the term bootstrapping, but when you choose your investors and when you raise capital, you, you have to be sure you understand what you're doing. And I think a lot of people raise money at valuations that are going to be hard to please everybody. Because as you know, if you raise money at a very high valuation, there's something that's going to come with that. And I don't want to get into the detail of capital structure today, but quite often the capital structure of businesses is not what we think it is from the outside and what looks like a home run isn't necessarily a home run for everyone. So, um, so what have I learned? I've learned a lot of things that, that I think I pass on to people, which is, you know, choose your investors carefully, protect the early investors as much as you can know that you're putting a lot of value into the hands of the later investors. They get better terms than the early investors, get your timing, right? Don't be greedy. If you want an exit exit, but if you, if you don't build a business forever and you know what what my the greatest advice i can give to every anybody today particularly today build a profitable business that you're happy to run for a very long time and live off the cash flow from that business and make sure your investors are happy with that as well and one day when you least expect it someone will come along and put a check in your hand very very early in my career someone said to me you know i thought every day in business it was potentially the last day until someone came along and put this big fat check in my hand. And, and that's, a, that's, that's, and I've experienced the same thing. I mean, 
building a business is so hard. You always think tomorrow could be the last day. You always do. What, what, what keeps you motivated to, uh, you know, jump right back into it? Have you ever taken time off? Yeah, I mean, many years ago when I sold my first business, it was called the Vacation Store. I had forced time off because I, I it kept me on as president, but it took me about three months to realize they didn't really want me around and I wasn't really able to work. I was too restricted from doing anything else at the time. So I had a few months off, my golf game improved and, and my kids were young. It was a great time to spend with them. You know, I thought I was going to take time off um, when we sold, when I was coming off the end of the earnout with the fascination. And then, you know, I stepped into right into able. So I, I have, I have, in a way, I, I haven't taken any sustainable time off, but I feel like, you know, I've had an amazing, amazing life. I mean, I, I've, I, you know, I've done all the things I was, I said to when I turned 60 and I'm over 60, when I turned 60, I wrote to my kids and I said, who are grown successfully in their careers and said, the one thing I will say to you is say yes to everything because I look around my friends today and I see them with their bucket lists and things that they want to do. And most of the things on their bucket list are things that I've already done, my wife and I have already done. And so, you know, I, I, um, I think that you can, work-life balance is a bit of a myth, but it's also everything. As you, if you love what you do and you love your work, you just got to live life around it and do and do. Yeah, you engineer your own balance out of it. Yeah, that. you absolutely do. Yeah. So yeah, so I'm 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 as enthusiastic today. I believe I'm as enthusiastic today as I was when I started out on this crazy journey all those years ago. And I always say to the team I'm working with, with absolute genuine belief that this is the best team that I've ever worked with, and it's the most fun I've ever had. Because I never look back and regret anything. I always love what I'm doing and enjoy what I'm doing. And I genuinely believe that today with the team I'm working with at Able, I'm, I'm working with an extraordinary team. I'm having a, a huge amount of fun and they're an amazing group of people I'm enjoying working with. So, you know, that that's how it has to be for you to get, get up in the morning, and do what you do. You obviously have a lot of exposure on the consumer side. What, what consumer verticals are you are you looking at these days or, and are excited about? You know, I've, um, like many people, I've, I've moved to the platform businesses now. You know, I think that uh, commerce enabling businesses are critical. I think there's a lot of even, them. even, yeah. I mean, I mean, if you look at commerce enablement, I think you need to be a winner, though. There's a tremendous amount of saturation in some of these verticals. If you, if you saw my inbox as a, as an operator, as someone with a brand, the number of, I mean, just taking something like we don't have an app right now. We will do before Black Friday, Cyber Monday. But the number of different companies that can come and build an app for you today, I'm not going to call out the one that I've picked because it would be unfair to everybody else. And, I, <laughs> and also, I don't have any experience yet. But, you know, I, 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 I pick one and, you know, my inbox is just full of the same message about the same commerce enabling idea. And there's just so many choices. Um, and so, you know, as an investor, you know, I've picked a few again and I, I went back to what i said at the beginning the people the idea the the inspiration how smart the people are whether they understand they got to work with a team well it's, it's interesting when you draw similarities and parallels between uh consumer products and then uh commerce technology businesses b2b SaaS. like it's they're in a, in a consumer business you know we talked a lot about community and brand building today that's a lot of the reason why people choose to follow and repurchase a product. It's different in the software space, especially when like, you know, you're seeing a commoditization of software and people can come up and build the exact same thing and offer it cheaper. It, it, it changes the equation of like what software has always been product led. It's like, we need to build the best product. That's how we're going to create the most loyalty. And that's tough to do in like a Shopify ecosystem. Yeah. I, I mean, and I, I, I honestly, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I mean, I've been incredibly lucky. I mean, to name one, I don't know if you're aware, it's not a direct competitor of yours by any means, but the creator agency, Whaler. And you, you told me about that. Yeah, I haven't seen their stuff. Yeah, though. So they're, they're, they're huge now. I mean, really, really huge in terms of top line revenue and bottom line. The two guys that founded that business came along and told me about that idea. I was their first check you know, on, on a very reasonable valuation. And I think they've done a lot of things right. And is and, that a, wait, so that's a consulting business that does, they just create a, produ a production. 
it's a no it, it, it they manage talent they do everything in the creator economy okay from, yeah from managing talent to big brand campaigns and then they and now they've even built um something that you mentioned earlier they bought built a measurement tool with nielsen actually to actually measure in a, accurately the impact of uh creators creator, yeah creators so so yeah i mean i i don't know how you pick from one to the other but you've got to love commerce enabling businesses uh, how you pick the winners, I'm not sure. Um, and then in terms of categories, I, I, you know, I'll always say this. I always think there's room for one more lifestyle brand. So <laughs> if you if you can find a niche in in a lifestyle and you can follow the trends of, you know, ethical business and sustainability in some way, shape, or form, and you can find a a, a niche for yourself, then uh, then you know there's you know, we're, we are always going to be astounded by where did this brand come from? That's going to always happen. And it's going to be brilliant people, visionary people with great ideas and going back to those seven steps, understanding, you know, the need or desire that they're, they're fulfilling and then doing everything just right. And, and the quality of the product is always going to be critical. So, so last couple of questions here. You're st let's say you're starting a consumer brand from scratch again today. What are your, where are you acquiring customers? Where are you going out? You built a great product. Where are you marketing it? What's your playbook? Yeah. So the playbook is, you know, I remember when I started the, 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 when I, when I started Lisa, my business partner who was, came from a more traditional background at the time, you know, he used to say to me, how are you going to build this business? And I said, we're going to start with influencers. And he'd say, well, what's an influencer? Cause it was back in that day when no one really sure was sure what an influencer was an influence. They came and they sort of went and now they're back. So I think that, uh, different kinds of influencers doing the right things. And, you know, we could call them, I mean, in, in, even performance PR, you know, the kind of affiliate influencer space, people with audience, you've got to start with where, how are you going to attract audience? Because people are on their phones every day. They're reading certain things. They're following people. That's going to be critical. So that, that piece of the jigsaw is critical. And then how you amplify that and the assets that you create is critical too. So, you know, you know, I, I, I still, I was talking to someone about this recently. If I was to start a mattress company today, where would I go? And, you know, I would certainly go to TikTok as an example. And, and, and the reason I would go there is that there's always a new group of consumers coming through and you have to go see what media they're consuming. So the beauty of Lisa at the time was that millennials were not well served for mattresses. Today, Gen Z are not well served for mattress purchases. So not that I'm doing it necessarily, but if I were, I would go to this next generation and I would say, how can I create the best creative to, you know, to, resonate with you? Go, you got to go where they are and you got to create creative. Uh, and then ultimately it's all the same stuff again. You got to have a great product. You got to have, you know, everything else, right? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think you need to understand how you're going to create it's there's more content today like you need to just be exercising that muscle daily and understanding what people want to consume and it needs to be less organic i mean more organic these days the other thing i would say is like brands need to be building a business that's more enduring and they need to understand you know that consumers they have so many more options today especially digitally than they did you know when you, when you lost lisa so you need to be playing to win the long game, win the marathon. That happens through, you know, hand to hand combat, through com uh, through through content over, you know, a more prolonged period of time. It's not just a lot about you know launching prospecting ads. And, yeah. I and think in those days our content created audiences, so we were in much more of a partnership with the people that had the audiences because they were building their audiences off our content as well. So we would create a piece of performance. We, we didn't even know it was a performance asset then, but it turned out to be a performance asset, a great article or a great review. And that enabled these media platforms, new media platforms, digital media platforms to grow their audience. Today, I just don't think we as brands help in the building of audience. So we have to go and find out ways that we can find audience. We can't buy it anymore. We've just got to find that audience. We've got to partner in different ways. We've got to be creative. But ultimately, it's about turning audiences 
into customers. That's what marketing's always been. And so finding cost-effective ways to reach those audiences wherever they are, making content that's relevant to them, and then delivering excellence, 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 excellence on a business model that makes sense. Yeah, I like that. That's that's a that's a good place for us to uh, to cap off the conversation. One thing I'll say is just tell us about the book. Uh, I know it's not out yet, uh, but what are you writing? When can we expect it? So I'm writing a book called uh, Unboxing, and the uh, the book is about. I mentioned it earlier. The relationship between anticipation and experience. So uh, it's it's this idea that in life and in marketing, everything that we do is whether you've got plans to get one of one of my good friends is getting married this weekend and you know he sent me a text this morning big weekend coming up you know everything is about anticipation and ultimately the experience has to exceed the anticipation for it to have been a great day or a great product so the unboxing moment is the moment of truth between anticipation and experience and the book is about how do you build the anticipation and how do you ensure that the experience is exceeds it and then how do you put the mechanisms in place to allow people to share that experience and uh i'm excited about it i mean i've i've uh i hope it'll be it, it's not going to be a life story that's for sure <laughs> but i hope it will be full of enough examples that people will enjoy reading it and it, it'll i hope it'll make you smile and laugh and i, I read the I, I read the preface so i can say it's got a mix of uh, soccer football and uh branding which we all appreciate um david thanks so much for joining us i appreciate it thank you thanks for having me